Welcome to the last lecture of the fall semester. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce Beatrice Galilee. Uh, let me give you the basic important information and then I'll, I'll give you like a short intro, which I think it can touch a little bit of what is the role of a curator or could be the role of a curator these days. Uh, but Beatrice uh, currently is the Daniel Broski Associate Curator of Architectural Design at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. Um, she was trained as an architect. And she was the chief curator of the 2013 Lisbon Architecture um, Trinale Closer Closen and has curated ex exhibitions and events around the world, including 2013 and 2012 Milan Design Weeks, 2011 Wanzhou Design Biennale, and 2009 Jensen Hong Kong Biennale, to name some of you. She was also an editor of Icon Magazine and has wrote, written articles in many other magazines. So you can always check online what, what, what are the credentials of the people that lecture here, and certainly she has an impressive one. Um, but what I wanted to touch base a little bit since we have the chance to have her here and take in, in such a prominent curator position in such a prominent institution, um, there is something that I always been in the back of my head, and I think it have to, in the back of my head, um, and it has to do with um, the mix that sometimes we have between English and Spanish, um, because curators in, 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 in Spanish is curadores, which also it could be curadores, and I'll get back to that. And this is what we think when we think about curators in one way or another, and so on. And we have some samples of the last Venice Binal curators, some have been architects, some of them curators by profession, like Aaron Besky, some of them theor theory people like Kurt Foster, and Rem and Sejima. But what I was saying in Spanish, a curador also is a healer. It's somebody who heals people with magical powers. It's not by medicine, it's by the deployment of faith and some other issues. And some of these times, um, also there is a sense of that that I think is interesting because in a way, uh, and there are very extreme, grotesque versions, uh, and there is one that in particular is very, very famous and powerful in Argentina, which is this guy who is incredibly popular. But what is interesting about this, and the difference between a curator and a curador or a healer, is that both, in a way, they produce and induce uh, a feeling of receiving what they're about to give to that people. So it requires an act of faith in part of the audience, individual and collective, but also have the incredible power to manipulate our feelings and so on. And if this is used with good purposes, some amazing thing can happen. And some curators, and now I'm talking about curators in architecture, have the capacity to trigger different conversations or, or get us to pay attention to things that we will not pay attention, or many, like unfortunately is, is the rule in some of the days, they just collect things without taking a position in relation to anything. So I like this problem between the Spanish version of curador and the English version of curator, and what is in the relation between that, and if it's about curating and managing and producing and introducing to an audience things, but also the possibility that they will heal you and they will require your faith. And there is something in between those two things that I think is an interesting problem to figure it out and how we manipulate audiences in one way or another, or how we construct audiences. So on that note, <clears throat> I want to welcome Beatrice to SIARC. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Hernan, um, for that lovely introduction. Um, I can't really offer any insights on the um, relationship between curating and, and healing, unfortunately. Um, but hopefully, 
we can have a nice conversation um, on this lovely Monday evening. And um, I'm going to share with you um, some of what I do as a curator, what I have done, um, and the, um, the opportunities that institutions of architecture have given me as, a, as an architect and then as a curator um, to explore and kind of mirror what's going on in architectural practice and give opportunities to young architects and also to kind of um, yeah, start, start conversations. Um, I just want to say first of all that um, this evening the um, London-based architecture collective, collaborative assemble won the Turner Prize, which is the first time an architectural organization of any kind has won the Turner Prize. Um, and uh, I think it's kind of a, an extraordinary moment because these guys, there's like 20 of them, I think, um, they studied at Oxford and um, their practice is you know, uh, the most hybrid um, artistic architectural practice. They work in public space, they invent their own projects, they lobby um, local governments, they solve problems, they make their own things, um, and they're kind of a bunch of architects, but also historians, geographers, philosophers, um, and they're really uh, kind of, a, it was a very inspiring thing to me today to read that they, um, they've been kind of honored with this big award in London. So that's just a little aside um, in the kind of hope for an architecture practice that's not the most straightforward model um, and a way of working that could be um, interesting for you guys too. So um, this was my starting point and um, where I met some of, actually the faculty here um, I know a little bit from my time as an editor at Icon magazine. Um, you know, I, I don't think they really exist in the same way um, that they did when I was working at Icon. Um, but with m me and the editorial team, we, we saw this magazine as a way um, not to kind of reflect what was going on and show photographs of buildings, but to, to try and um, frame an opinion, to kind of create a narrative of the practice that we saw around us. Um, and this process of um, ref not just reflecting the news but also trying to make the news is something that really fed into um, what I ended up doing as a curator. Um, for example, this profile, Activist Architects, in 2008, um, where we um, brought like Alejandro Aravena and um, architects who were working in um, uh, you know, urban think tank and people like that who were working in more unusual architectural scenarios where they were lobbying governments and, and doing what Assemble um, are doing now, actually. Um, and also for the 50th issue when we asked people to write manifestos and, um, again, kind of generating content through a medium which is not really architectural but somehow has this ability to influence and, and create um, a new... Um, maybe a new idea or a new story or a new way of, of talking about architectural practice. Um, so after ICON, I've never presented this project before, um, but I moved to China in 2009 and the first exhibition that I did was in um, a desert in Inner Mongolia, which is a very odd um, place and um, is owned by China, but is essentially empty. And um, Beijing wanted to populate Ordos with um, people and places and build lakes even though there's no natural water there um, and um, on one site this um, millionaire decided that he wanted to work with Ai Weiwei to um, build 100 houses in the desert um, and he he worked with Ai Weiwei and Herzog and Dumeron and um, all allocated 100 architects to the 100 sites and each architect was um, asked to make a building that was I think a thousand square meters. So kind of this strange utopian project, all these architects went to the middle of the desert in Inner Mongolia, they got their site, then they designed their houses. Some of them are here. Some of the, some people will know more or less about this. Um, and some of the houses were great, some of the houses were terrible, but I was asked to work with Joseph Rima um, and create an exhibition of these little houses that hadn't existed and actually ended up never existing because um, the guy who commissioned them um, ended up moving to France and was never heard of again. So it was a really odd project and really the only thing in this desert that was built was this art museum which is where we were, were supposed to do the show. And so we thought about it like well we can't really show these buildings because they're just ideas at the moment. Um, all we really know is that a hundred people from a hundred places that are not in Mongolia have been invited to this place. 
um, from wherever they are, bringing their own ideas, bringing maybe something from that place that they're from. Um, so we, we did this show called Convergence 142, and we invited um, each of the architects who were part of this 100 Architects project to, um, to write something about the place that they were from, like a little note, an, an anecdote almost about the city that they're from, like a place that they um, found memorable or that would kind of maybe explain something about who they were as people, because that was really the only tangible thing that we felt that we, you know, um, that we could learn from what, what these little houses were, because <laughs> we didn't really have anything else to go on. So we, we brought these people together. Um, so I'm just going to read out this little um, piece, which was um, from um, Adrian Zenin, where he explained about this um, spatial phenomenon that happens um, under an underpass or flyover in Jakarta. Um, on a regular day, it's just an empty space. <coughs> But on the short moments when it's the heaviest, when it's really heavy rain, hundreds of motorcyclists would take shelter, quickly blocking the traffic. The phenomena can only occur where public transportation is not effective, urban sprawl is massive, traffic is heavily congested, and the motorcycle is the only affordable mode of transportation for the lower income. So with this short text in this gallery in the middle of the desert, um, we kind of have this insight into Jakarta suddenly we're sort of transported onto into like a rainy day in Jakarta um, and we, we put that together with the other 99 um, pr um, proposals and along with some artists from the collection to make up this 142 um, and so you can see that we use the latitude um, as a way of kind of presenting the projects and where we had a little model we put it next to the, the idea of the text um, so this kind of strange exhibition was my, um, the first show that I ever did and was a kind of guide to um, everywhere and anywhere and a way of understanding buildings as less about formal ideas and more about maybe the places that they're from and also a little bit about the idea of China and the tabula rasa. Um, so I'm actually, I was talking to Joseph today and we were thinking about making a little book about this. So it's nice that I started with it. Um, in um, Shenzhen, which is in the south of China, so I went from Inner Mongolia, which is in the north, to Shenzhen, which is in the south. Um, I worked on this Biennale in 2009. Um, and this was a moment when, um, you know, the Biennale, which really is most people associate with Venice, um, had moved from this idea of like nation states doing the pavilions um, to more this kind of competition between cities. So Shenzhen was doing a Biennale. There was Biennales in you know Milan and London and um, you, know, you know all over all over the world. Um, and this this moment in 2009 was one where they really started to kind of regenerate, um, so that this idea of Shenzhen wasn't a place where there was just industry, but it was this post-industrial place where culture. Um, started to um, regenerate the city itself, kind of these glo the global city, um, to coin a phrase. So this is Shenzhen. That, that roof line um, is the, like the, one of the biggest buildings I've ever seen in my life. Um, you know, it's hard to imagine, if you haven't been there, the scale of this. Um, and we were invited to consider the topic of city mobilization. So how do you um, present architecture in this context of a city that has regenerated from um, a fishing village in 1981 into 2009 when it had 15 million people within Shenzhen and the greater Shenzhen region? Um, and all of this is new built. Everything that you can see has been built in the last 30 years. Everyone who populates the city of Shenzhen has been there you know, less than 20 years. Like the average age is less than 40. It is an extraordinary place. And so, as a curator, I invited um, people to, architects who I felt could make new works, but also who could add things to the city, so that the participants of the Biennale were um, the citizens. They weren't kind of the global elite who probably, let's face it, maybe 100 people came from outside of Shenzhen to that event. Um, so we had this sense of participation. Um, this is a project by Didier Faustino. He made this, uh, a swing called Double Happiness. And you could just <laughs> climb up onto the swing and sort of look over the city. Um, that, um, this photograph is in the collection of MoMA now, along with a little model that Didier made. 
Um, we invited architects, Liu Jiaokun, who's one of my favorite Chinese architects, to make this public space, just this helium balloons and this super simple idea of this um, netting that you get that's usually on the outside of buildings that are under construction. We also um, had some more critical projects. Um, this is a, a, like one of the other ideas about the Biennale was that we would bring the show to the city. It wouldn't be that everyone had to go to this art space. So this is a downtown um, shopping district. And this, we made this kind of garden um, in the middle of the city that seems to be like a very beautiful, you know, kind of farming, bucolic situation here. But actually, um, it's actually a, a sort of diagram of um, uh, the kind of food production of the city. So um, in the top right-hand corner, I think I have a little buzzer, this, uh, this area here is the area that represents the land mass of Shenzhen. And this is the amount of food that it costs, that the area of food that it, that it takes to feed that amount of space because of the density of the people living in the urban region and the sort of, you know, essentially 40% of the, of, the, of the planet is devoted to the growth of ag agriculture and 2% um, to urban living. Um, and this is an example of a, a piece that was really quite diagrammatic but also worked really well in the city and had little, you know, explaining what it was and little grass. We grew all the different types of food that was required to, um, to feed Shenzhen. And I found out that actually this is still there, you know, um, six years later, this little garden is still growing and people are still taking care of it. So we were able to, um, through this Biennale, just leave something behind and it was quite, quite a lovely thing and they have a little farmer's market that runs every year apparently. One of the other questions that we were asked um, in Shenzhen was uh, by this group called Go West Project, who were interested in the idea of like, well, how can we explain through, in an architecture exhibition about another place? So how do we bring another place um, to this site? And they were, um, in a way, similar to the, the project that we were running in Ordos, like how do you explain what another place is? And their answer is, um, well, who knows the most? Who knows the juiciest gossip? about a place who tells you all the insider info about a city, and it's the taxi drivers. So they decided to ask all the tax taxi drivers from all over the west of China, places that people didn't really know about, like um, Wuhan, um, Chongqing, Zhengzhou, um, and Shangsha, uh, which are cities that have a population of like between eight and 12 million. Um, those places that even the people of Shenzhen didn't really know about. Um, and they managed to persuade these six taxi drivers from those different regions to drive all the way to Shenzhen and then park outside the Biennale. Um, and basically you could get into one of these taxis and drive around the city with the taxi driver who would then, you would say like, so, you know, what's the weather like in Wuhan this time of year or whatever. And so through this interaction with the taxi driver, um, you had this like, intimate relationship, this like instant reaction, the stories from these places and stories from these cities that you otherwise wouldn't get. And they made a little installation of the film when they interviewed the taxi drivers and their families, who um, some of them took days and days to reach uh, down to Shenzhen. Um, so it was a really uh, beautiful, um, thoughtful project. Equally, as part of the show, um, I worked with Aberrant Architecture, who invented um, you use the exhibition as a way to invent a business. Um, and they made this kind of fake trade show, um, which was really did confuse quite a few people because it looked so authentic. So they made this installation, which was um, a way of explaining um, how to run a business in Shenzhen or the people that move to Shenzhen that start new businesses. Um, and they um, made little videos and made a, essentially made a franchise for people who would work from home. So they had brochures, they had people standing in suits, um, and people from the audience from the Biennale were like, how do I, <laughs> kind of interested in your business ideas actually, and how do, how do I get one of these franchises? Um, so uh, the kind of, the role of architects through this Biennale was quite, um, quite expansive, and we wanted to use it as a way to, to challenge the kind of practice that architects can do, and um, the way that architects can examine um, urban conditions and also come up with um, kind of valid business proposals. 
you can ask any questions about this at the end. Um, so after Shenzhen, I was invited to participate in um, a Biennale in South Korea, which um, was curated by Ai Weiwei with Sung Yo Sang. Um, I think this was quite an important exhibition. Um, Ai Weiwei was put in prison in the middle of this show, so we didn't work with him as much as we would have liked, but um, it was a very, um, for me, it was a very influential show because it was, the premise of the exhibition was to examine and re-examine. Design is design is not design. Um, that the thing is only is the thing is only what the thing is not um, is the way to understand what the thing is. So he did an exhibition which had unnamed design, which was people, um, you know, maybe in like kind of developing countries, or people who were inventing things on their own, versus named design, which was. Um, Rem Kohlhaas or Dillas Gavidia Renfro and put them side by side. I was invited to do um, something different, which was to examine the idea of community in this concept. And um, I was uh, kind of interested in the idea of like, okay, well, how can I exhibit community? That's a bit of a night, kind of like a nightmare task. Um, and I thought about the idea of open source community and how we could. Um, think about the architecture that's being practiced um, that doesn't really have a physicality, um, that people are sharing this kind of, the sharing economy was just being a kind of term that was coming up, the kind of civic, um, uh, the, the way that people were using civic space and architects were being more empowered to support um, state, pro certainly in London, um, government initiated projects. And um, so I invited Architecture Zero Zero to come up with a project that would represent the concept of open source design. And so the way that they responded to this brief was to invent um, a project called WikiHouse. Has anyone heard of WikiHouse before? Right, well, <laughs> it's, um, it was an exhibition. You know, This was something that came out of a, a brief and a task and they ran with it. And it's something I find kind of amazing still that um, this whole project was transcribed in you know, Korean first and then in English. Um, essentially, the, um, the WikiHouse is something where you go online to www.wikihouse.cc um, and you can use SketchUp online to design a house um, with certain parameters. Um, and then after a while, you finish designing your house, you press a button and um, it generates what you can see in number two, which is cutting plates, CNC cutting plates. And then um, if you can get to step three, which is use a CNC mill to cut your design, you can get to stage four, which is build your own house, which you downloaded from the internet. Zero Zero came up with um, these 10 principles of open source design, which um, still are on their website today. Um, I love the John Maynard Keynes, which is number 10, which is it's easier to ship recipes than cakes and biscuits which is one of the kind of um, principles of the open source um, movement in terms of architecture. These are the ideas that they came up with in 2011, and as of 2015, these are the wiki houses that I could find online that have been made, like someone who found it on NPR and just made one, and the architects themselves who were um, working with a number of different organizations to, to roll out wiki house in, um, for like emergency relief or for you know back garden building and how did they get to build second stories and things like that. Um, but it certainly sort of gives me pause for thought as a curator to think that you can actually initiate and collaborate with real buildings in an exhibition. You don't have to show photographs of buildings so you can actually be quite productive as a curator. Um, I started talking of institutions um, Aberrant Architecture, who, with people who did them, the little um, sort of booth thing in Shenzhen, um, worked, we worked together to start this institution called the Gopher Hall, which um, was underneath a Mexican restaurant in East London <laughs> that um, we, we made it for two years. It's kind of like inspired by storefront to some extent. And um, we organized talks and we, um, tried to promote the work of people who didn't have a platform and whose work was in between, the something in between that we felt that um, 
as, as an institution that we wanted to represent and anything that couldn't really find a home or couldn't really be represented easily in a magazine or in another institution. Um, so we had um, this kind of open, open platform um, for people to do whatever they wanted. This was a dinner that we organized um, with a food artist where like, there, everything had no utensils. So like um, these buns that were floating from the ceiling, you had syringes with oil and vinegar, um, and you had to eat without your hands. We also worked with Domus magazine um, and exhibited this project Heracles, where we asked people to um, invent a bridge connection between Europe and Africa. And Björk Ingels designed the 1,000 Afro note as his medium of transportation. So sorry if I'm rattling through this, because I want to talk about um, this project, which is um, the, probably the biggest show that I've done so far. Um, and the idea behind this um, exhibition was to try and solidify and bring together all the curatorial experiences I'd had um, before this, um, to try and ask some questions about um, the profession of architecture, to reflect a little bit about what we felt was happening in 2013, which was a real crisis in Europe, um, a real um, lack of identity for the practice of architecture, um, we wanted to provide platforms for um, younger architects, essentially. We didn't really feel that it was important to um, promote the work of architects who were very well established and famous. Um, and we used kind of in the invention of the architectural curator as a, as a methodology. Um, these were all of the the terms that we use to try and understand what architecture, what, if, what kind of other, other disciplines affected architecture, other disciplines that we could regard um, as being connected to architecture or be effective, effective um, to understand and, and to experience um, space, essentially. So we, we were kind of, talk, as a curatorial team, talking about this. And then when we opened the exhibitions, we started with asking questions. Um, and as a curatorial, technique, we just put out all these questions online. Um, so what is architecture in a time of crisis? And people could put in the answers. Um, we, we asked what's the function of an architecture exhibition. Um, so <laughs> we had like, the architectural exhibition is an outdated venue to look at utopia. Um, and we had way less abusive um, remarks than I thought that we would have, um, but we did get some. So who do we design for? Um, and what questions should arch architecture be asking today? Um, and through this exhibition, through this series of exhibitions, we had um, three exhibitions and a public program. And the first one was by um, Liam Young, who um, we used his exhibition as a, a way of discussing the concept of architectural speculation. And it was in this amazing um, building, which is um, the essentially like the electricity company of um, of Lisbon. Um, and you can see we kind of wrapped all of the graphics around this great big gas drum. Um, and this is essentially like the heart of the show. And Liam decided to use um, fiction, and he commissioned a number of writers to kind of imagine these different districts. And the Future Perfect was an imaginary city that each, um, each quarter of this exhibition was this kind of extraordinary spatial experience. Um, the Wilds, um, where we worked with Cohen van Bellen to build a forest. So there was this, um, inside the exhibition, there was like, real trees. Liam and I went out tree shopping one day and bought tons of trees, and we filled the exhibition space with it. And um, Cohen van Bellen, um, basically invented um, a kind of species that, um, a kind of species of blueberry that was designed to um, eradicate rabies in a certain breed of wolf. Um, and this was like part of the world that Liam designed and invented. Um, there was the garment district, which we worked with Bart Hess, um, where there's this most beautiful 
installation of, of like what would be the clothes, what would be the fabrics of the city, what would be the materiality of our fashions and how we want to present ourselves in the future perfect. Um, and this um, amazing dress was made by plunging um, this woman into a pool where the, then the top of the pool was a sort of warm wax and she plunged into it and then kind of moved around and then we pulled her out and then what, what remains is this kind of um, solidified water, essentially. Um, it, was quite, it was quite beautiful. Liam also commissioned um, a film and worked with Factory 15, Moore and Ellis to make a movie and he went on site to India to film it and make it um, and show it. So the exhibition space became this kind of cinema. So we had the, the kind of lookout um, where people were um, on this very smooth um, kind of uh, sort of mountainy, mountainous landscape. And then we had the forest, we had the dresses. Um, so it was a very um, visceral and weird and dark experience that people were really confused about why this was in an architecture exhibition. They couldn't. They were like, well, this is great. Where, where do I see some Alvaro Caesar buildings? Um, so we had, like, we had some um, identity crisis problems to some extent, but it was, it was a truly wonderful um, exhibition. We also wanted to talk about, we didn't want to make like exhibition after exhibition that had the same idea. We wanted to show these different ideas and how they kind of gradually overlapped. Um, and Mariana Pastana curated a show called The Real and Other Fictions. And it was set in a palace, a crumbling old palace in the middle of the city. And Mariana wanted to look at each of the rooms of this palace and make scenes. So the exhibition was a series of scenes and moments and um, was, it, was a kind of about the idea of architectural space as art and poetry and writing and action. Maria Fusco, um, who is a wonderful writer, um, was in residence in the building and wrote um, a text about the building and read it out during the exhibition. And these were the kind of the quality of the rooms, like this extraordinary um, sort of faded grandeur of this um, palace, the 17th century palace. Um, and we commissioned. Um, the projects that were commissioned were related to the previous uses of the building. So each room had this sort of scribed space that was explained to it um, through Mariana's texts and writings. And then each of the architects came in and responded to the previous use of the, of the spaces. So this was a room where people um, used to meet and congregate um, uh, for this sort of um, a kind of political group. And so this um, Porto-based architecture firm made a fanzine machine in that room and tried to kind of regenerate and discuss what was going on in Portugal at that moment, what was happening in the city at that time. And there was this real intense gathering. And the same with Zulu Ark, who, um, who were interested in the idea of utilizing the exhibition as a space to, under, to kind of invent the idea of a universal declaration of human rights or urban rights. And they took this parliament and put it into the street and moved it from space to space. Um, Mariana programmed um, dinners and events, again, curating the idea of a meal, curating the idea of um, a conversation. Working with the Centre for Genomic Astronomy, each of the dishes were related to themes of the talk. Each of the, um, the, whole, the whole experience of it was very intensely designed. We also worked with an artist called Alex Schwader. Um, he found out that the history of this room used to be a bedroom. And um, you lie, and it was um, a room where people um, were, um, were trapped, essentially, um, because um, I forget the exact story about it <laughs> right now. But essentially what happens is that you lie on one of these um, beds, like backwards, like this on a sofa. So you have your head facing on this side. And, gra and gradually, the, the whole structure of, of inflates around you, like the floor emerges, and you're kind of then moved and trapped into this um, bed next to probably a perfect stranger. So this was, the whole thing took about half an hour to deflate and inflate. Um, it was one of the more intense uh, exhibits in the show. Um, Noam Torum also was looking at um, the history of the building that at one point had been used um, as a place for um, 
people were, like, as I said, people were trapped, um, were, were hiding from the government, and this was a story of people who were dreaming. So on one side, these kind of these different dreams that were taking place, and there was a film that went over the top of this installation. So this whole exhibition was quite, again, like very visceral and very artistic, um, very unusual. Um, and a series of very complicated stories and tales and spaces and rooms that talked about architecture as a space of inhabiting stories and that you don't really understand architecture without understanding what took place and what could take place within it. Um, for our public program, we decided um, to position all of our public talks in public space. We didn't want to have a lecture hall um, where people may not feel that they could participate, and we wanted to have all of the conversations outdoors, um, which turned out to be quite a good idea, except it was like, I don't know what the Fahrenheit is, but like about 100 degrees, <laughs> I felt like, so, and there was no shade on the square. So um, we were very hot for all of the public talks, it was boiling hot, um, but people were able to use this stage designed by Frida Escobedo um, for all of our, uh, kind of, we had mayoral talks, we had a play by Andres Hacker, um, which was reinstalled at the Chicago Biennial this year. So we kind of had this ability to transform this part of public space as part of the exhibition. Um, the final show that we did in Lisbon was called the Institute Effect. Um, and the idea of this exhibition was to kind of uh, bring together everything that we knew to be true about the way that architecture is produced, um, which is that it's all of the ideas need to, need to be disseminated. And this idea was kind of how do we explain the dispersion of architectural practice um, through, um, through these, inst these great institutions like Storefront, Z33 in Europe, um, Liga in Mexico, Strelka in Russia, um, the Institute of Radical Spatial Education, which was an invented thing by um, the um, Spatial Agency in London. So we tried to provide each of these institutions with a platform in Lisbon. So we invited each one to come for one week. Um, and they came, 13 of them came for the whole, over the course of the whole Biennale. Um, and they provided, essentially moved what they were doing and wherever it was in the world to Lisbon. Um, whether it was um, a talk or a film or a workshop or an event, um, we felt like we were trying to create a dialogue between Lisbon and the rest of the world. Um, we also were able to have over a hundred um, associated projects. So while we, our budget was pretty limited, we were able to work with all of these different people who wanted to be associated with what we were doing um, and who were interested in um, performing architecture, in urban interventions, in cinema, in asking questions. And we were, um, I think, in some ways, the associated projects were more successful than the shows. People felt more engaged in them, where they were more, more dynamic, they had more um, roots in the city. Um, and in many ways, people, I still meet people who did an associated project or were part of an associated project that, um, that, they, yeah, that really kind of mattered to them. We were also able to produce some books, um, not all of them, but most of them have been published. Um, and they are, um, again, e-books, which, um, which for Liam, for example, explored the whole realm, all of the f short stories that influenced his structure for Mariana, um, for the real and other fictions. They were also stories that bring together all of her ideas for the exhibition. So a lot of what we were talking about, we tried to kind of condense into these um, publications. Um, so I learned quite a lot in the idea of, um, in, Lis in Lisbon, um, you know, we made an exhibition that was very much about the now and about that moment and that was um, quite complicated and quite hard to understand in some ways. And, um, but we also felt like we did something as a group of people um, that we were quite proud of. We got really criticized in the press. <laughs> like some, not all, but like, you know, some people were just um, really disappointed that there wasn't m more to show, that there wasn't more architecture on display. Um, but I think through these publications and, you know, through our discourse since we opened the show, I think 
um, each of the exhibitions really did move something forward for, for the people who participated and for us. So I think, you know, we're certainly very proud of it. Um, and it meant that I got, um, was lucky enough to be chosen to be the, um, the first architecture curator at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, um, which I started um, about a year ago, a year and a half ago. Um, and this is something that um, the museum essentially um, <coughs> has never had an architecture curator, even though the, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, for those of you that have been there, has almost the whole history of architecture under its roof. It's like 5,000 years of architectural history. We have the Temple of Denda, that's um, you know Egyptian history. We have Roman columns. We have the temple, the column from the temp Temple of Artemis. We have um, sketchings by Piranesi. We have original books um, from the 20s by Corbusier. Um, we have rooms by Frank Lloyd Wright. And despite this, you know, incredible spectrum of architectural achievement, the Metropolitan Museum has never um, had an architecture curator before. So um, it's a real privilege to be the first um, person to hold that post. My first exhibition um, opened last year, um, which was um, by the photographer Wolfgang Tillmans. And um, Wolfgang's um, work, as anyone who knows it, um, is not usually about architecture, but somehow has this architectural intimacy and component. And this exhibit was um, part of the 2014 Venice Biennale, curated by Rem, and it was in a room on its own. And I went in there and I, I stayed for the whole 45 minutes, which I never do, I like never do that in Venice. Um, it's always like a dragged out or have a spritz or something, but I stayed in there for the whole 45 minutes. And I spoke to Wolfgang about it and he said, he felt like it was, um, it was, a, it was, a, it was a, a way of showing architecture for him that he, that he really found important and profound, and I did too. And um, the way that it works is there's two screens <coughs> here, and each, every 10 seconds, there's a whole different array of architectural photographs. And he's taken them while he's on a plane, while he's on the street, and Wolfgang just walks around with a, a camera on his chest most of the time. And so sometimes they're really from a bus, um, and other times he's quite deliberately composed them. And they sort of cycle through for about 45 minutes, just, just like blinking in and out, like a slideshow. Um, and it's quite, it's quite moving, actually, to see architecture in this very, very intimate and also kind of brutal way, because it's really, it's the same, um, the lens that he uses is the same as the human eye. So it has this truth to it that's quite startling when you see um, when you see these windows that are kind of patched up with a bit of gum or that they're kind of, you know, that the facade is one thing, but because people have put multicolored curtains behind it, it becomes something totally different. Or um, a detail that he's noticed on a bridge that's really beautiful. And so you find this, you find his interest in architecture, your interest in architecture. And one of the things I'm trying to do at the Met is to kind of gather these architectural impressions from artists as well as, um, you know, putting forward new works by contemporary architects. Um, so this work is now part of the permanent collection of the museum. And um, next year, next year, um, I'm going to be curating an installation on the roof of the Met, um, which is kind of great. Um, we have this extraordinary opportunity, which is this roof garden. This year, the um, French artist Pierre Huyghe um, dismantled this whole roof and moved pillars away from it um, to talk about. Um, it, it was kind of extraordinary and beautiful, and um, he, he basically took um, the history away from the building and put some history back into the building. So he found these prehistoric tools um, that were part of the museum's collection and put them on the roof. Um, he, um, he sort of planted little seeds, and so after the whole, after the summer, each of those empty um, holes were filled with weeds and grasses that came from, um, that were kind of pollinated by the experience of being on the roof. Um, and again, it was this very, it was a very beautiful experience. But um, next year, um, the British artist Cornelia Parker is going to build um, an installation on the roof, which I'm going to be um, responsible for. So I hope that you will join me for that. Um, this is her previous 
some previous work by her, if you don't know it. Um, on the left is a shed that she, um, a garden shed that she constructed out of sheds of her friends and then built the shed, put it into a forest and the British army blew it up for her, exploded it. And then she picked up all the pieces and then brought them to the gallery in London and rehung them with a light bulb in the middle. And she didn't expect that kind of um, huge shadow that came out of it. She didn't anticipate it, but the effect is something like, you know, seeing something explode and also contract at the same time. Um, so it's quite, it was quite an extraordinary piece. Um, and on the right is a piece called Mass, which um, is, the, is the charcoal remains of a church that was burnt down um, in an arson attack. She's made another, um, She's made another installation, which is um, a church that she just found that had been burnt down by a lightning, a thunderbolt. Um, and she was so interested in this idea that actually churches get burnt down in America, um, like black churches get burnt down in arson attacks. So um, she made this second piece. So these are the kind of spatial and, and, and sculptural installations that Cornelia Parker is known for. Um, and she's going to be working with me next year. Um, and finally, also happening next year is that the Met is moving into um, this fantastic building by Marcel Boyer on Madison Avenue. Um, the um, Modern and Contemporary Department is um, going to be programming this space. I'm going to be doing some exhibitions there in the future. Um, I'm going to be making a small installation in the courtyard of this space with, with the landscape architect Gunter Vogt. Um, and, um, we'll be doing some exhibitions there in the future. So, um, yeah, I hope I haven't bored you all to tears, and I hope that you have some questions, and um, thank you very much for having me. That's it.